My name's Emmy Speens, and welcome to A Mid B Covers Hat D, Episode 7. Episode 7 opens on Driftmark, where the entirety of the Targaryen and Valerian family lines gather to mourn the loss of Lena Valerian. Lord Corliss's brother, Lord Vaymond Valerian, gives a passive aggressive eulogy, calling out Lenor almost by name for diluting the Valerian bloodline with Rhaenyra's bastards. He emphasizes the words true born and looks directly at Lenor standing apart from Nera and her children. Lenor is nearly catatonic with grief. Damon laughs and it's all very rude. Otto Hightower has been named Hand of the King in the wake of Lionel Strong and Harwin Strong's deaths at Aaron Hall. Unfortunately, this funerary service just looks nondescript and like any other party on House of the Dragon this season. Rhaenyra searches for her husband Lenor, who seems nowhere to be found, and finds her son Jace instead. She encourages him to go comfort his cousins, Bela and Reyna, while he complains that he too has a right to grieve his true father, Harwin Strong. Rhaenyra puts a quick stop to that one and sends him off. Alicent is watching Rhaenyra like an obsessive, unhinged hawk, and Rhaenyra is on edge as a result. I can't say I blame her. Helena, Alicent's daughter, is playing with bugs and murmuring things that sound an awful lot like prophecies. Hand turns loom, spool of green, spool of black, dragons of lash, dragons of thread, the hand turns. Ah! Who does that remind you of? Greens, blacks, Otto Hightower, perhaps? Hand of the King, right? Ah! Basically saying he's responsible for Dance of the Dragons. Ah! Aemond and Aegon look on on their sister Helena playing with bugs and discuss Aegon's apparent betrothal to her. Aemond is obsessed with being the perfect Valyrian pureblood or whatever and thinks it's weird that Aegon wouldn't want to marry his sister. Aegon is not supposed to come off very well in this scene because he jokes about liking sex and pretty girls and drinking, but honestly he's the only person left on Alicent's corner aside from Helena with that evil creepy creeper vibes. Like he just seems like a normal spoiled kid to me. Laris is staring at Allison unabashedly. Nearly construct. Kristen would know. So Kristen Cole approaches his queen Allison with this information that Laris has been creepily eyeing her since they arrived at Driftmark and she says grimly that he's just proud to be the new lord of Harrenhal. Nobody else thinks it's weird that he's smiling like a goon after both his brother and father just died. Okay, whatever. Jace tries his best to comfort his young cousins Bela and Reyna. Aemon comes along and ruins it with his mere presence alone. Corlys tries to impress upon Lucerys, Rhaenyra's middle son, the importance of his future Driftmark lordship. As the second son, he would stand to inherit Driftmark after Laenor. But Lucerys is very, very sad, and he doesn't want it. When Corlys says, no, kid, it's your duty, it's fine, he says, if he's gonna be the lord of Driftmark one day, everyone's dead. And I wasn't sure if he was just like a sad little boy, like really tragic, um, because at this point he doesn't know that he's a bastard, or if he has like prophetic visions that make him upset to see that he's like one day in power or something. I don't know. Rhaenyra and Rhaenys don't talk at the funeral ceremony, and I would have loved to see how that relationship broke down and of all in the 10 years. You'd think like these two narratively important women, their relationship would be really vital to the story, but oh well. I guess it's about Rhaenyra's relationship with men mostly. I wish it weren't like that. Rhaenys straight up doesn't care for for Rhaenyra's children. She can see right through them as bastards. She barely acknowledges them, if ever. Damon and Rhaenyra make eyes at each other for two long. Dude, it's too long. We finally catch up with Lenor, who's in a fugue state standing in the ocean. Again, catatonic with grief. Corlys sees him and is so distraught by the scene that he finds Lenor's lover, Sir Carl, in the middle of the party and commands him to go find his patron, Lenor. The scene attracts attention. Corlys's brother, Sir Vaymon Valerian, even chastises him for bringing attention to the fact that Lenor's gay. Viserys approaches Damon with an olive branch. He's nearly successful in mending the bridge between the brothers until he suggests that Damon might need a place in Viserys' court. Viserys should know his brother well enough by now, though, to know that if anyone suggests 
Damon needs something, he's gonna push back against it. Damon needs to be the one that's needed, which some of the Targaryens understand better than others. We'll come back to that. Damon forcefully rejects Viserys' peace offering, and he upsets my poor baby king for no reason. Sir Otto then offers his condolences to Damon for the loss of his wife, Lena, to which Damon responds by calling Sir Otto a leech who's never satisfied. Then Damon takes his leave. Rhaenyra tells her boys to hit the hay and then predictably follows Damon wherever he's going. It's kind of wild to me that she would dare do this in the middle of a party, especially when Allison is watching her like a hawk. Like, the vultures that started that rumor of her being romantic with her uncle in the first place are the ones watching her at that party. Why would she just fuck? Viserys accidentally calls Allison by his first wife's name, Emma, and then he goes to bed. He doesn't apologize, but honestly, no one's really gracious in that moment either, and nobody offers any condolences for his failing memory. He's an older guy, dude. Least of all, <laughs> offering him comfort is Allison, who seems disgusted by his frailty and insulted. Sir Otto finds Aegon passed out and sends the boy to his room. Sir Carl finally returns with Lenor, who just stumbles his way through the party into bed. Apparently through the only available entrance to Driftmark's keep. Aemon tears Vagar, Lena's dragon, in the distance. Rhaenys and Corlys discuss in private how Daemon treated Lena in her final days. Rhaenys resents the fact that Daemon took her over to Pentos and she wasn't there to be treated by their maesters. In truth, the physicians in Pentos were as well equipped as the maesters in Westeros to handle what happened to Lena. Rhaenys suggests that they're being punished for their pride, but Corlys says it's not prideful to go after something that was once rightfully his wife's. But Rhaenys hits back that she will no longer play a part in the delusion that what he does, he does for her honor. Everyone knows it's his own ambition which guides him, not this righteousness about what was taken from his wife. She then goes on to beg Corlys to name Lena's girls as the heirs to Driftmark in lieu of Rhaenyra's bastard children, who would rightfully have it through Sir Laenor. She says that it's only right because Bay Bela and Reyna are Corliss's true blood. But Corliss is horrified by this. Doing that would basically just be confirming to the whole realm that they believe those vicious rumors about the boys he loves and considers to be his grandchildren. He says it would cast a dark shadow over them, one that's darker than already exists, and he's right. Lord Corliss points out rightfully that there's nothing more worthwhile in this life than the pursuit of legacy. History doesn't remember blood, history remembers names. And with that, he dismisses the matter. He recognizes Rhaenyra's children as trueborn, at least for now. Rhaenyra vents to Daemon about the hopelessness of making her marriage to Laenor work. It's not fooling anyone. They discuss Sir Harwin Strong and Lionel Strong's deaths, and Daemon suggests that Alicent and Sir Otto Hightower are to blame for their deaths. Rhaenyra pushes back against this and says, no, like, she can't attribute that kind of depravity to Alicent. She doesn't think, for all that Alicent has done, that Alicent is capable of that. She does think that Damon's capable of some depravity, which in the context of a conversation about murdering someone seems like pretty important foreshadowing. Speaking of depravity, they reminisce about that creepy time her uncle left her in a brothel drunk and scared after kissing her. He says that he spared her by leaving her there. She says he abandoned her by leaving her there, but they bone it out and everything's fine. I think this is practical though for Rhaenyra too. We get an extended sequence where she's clearly not just in it for the love making, you know what I mean? Like, look, she needs kids that look Targaryen. I can see the wheels turning in her head, right? And you know Damon, he never misses with that white hair. See, a couple of white haired kids, that's the type of political juice she needs right now. And by political juice, I do mean Damon's political juice. Their boning scene on the beach, though, goes too far, and it is too long. There's no reason for it. It's too dark. It's too long. For being a funeral for his wife, like funerary services for his wife, and nobody's like, hmm, where did Rhaenyra and that widower go? Especially Alicent. She practically brings binoculars around so she can keep an eye on the bitch. Aemon goes to find Vagar, who warms up to him after he shows off a little high Valyrian. He takes flight in Vagar in an astonishing display of recklessness, not caring that he doesn't know how to land or hang on. It's kind of like the most joy you'll ever feel in Aemon's presence. It doesn't last long. Bela and Reyna see that Vagar, their mother's dragon, has been stolen. They go to wake up Jace and Lucerius to find out who the culprit is. Aemon is high off the thrill of taking a dragon for his own, finally, but he goes at 
Bela and Reyna like at a hundred. He calls them ugly. Then he tells Jace and Lucerius that they're bastards. The girls and the Valyrians try their best, but Aemond is like older than them and also super skilled apparently. He has no problem just decking those girls in the face and he's also ready to kill. I didn't know he was an expert in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but I guess Kristen Cole's been going pretty hard at it with them in the fucking training yard. Jace did come to the fight with a dagger, but he only brandished it because Aemond was choking his brother out. I don't understand why Aemond was so vicious right off the bat. He didn't seem that spoiled or that confrontational with them earlier in the episode. It seemed like he just had trouble connecting at most. But when Lucerys finally slashes his eye out, I can't say it wasn't deserved. Finally, the Kingsguard break up the fight. The royal families gather in the Great Hall at Driftmark to adjudicate. Viserys demands to know why no one was there to defend the boys from one another, and Kristen Cole says that they're not really in the business of breaking up fights between princes because he's a little shit who doesn't know how to keep his mouth shut. Kristen gives these little pithy responses throughout the meeting that warrant jail time. Poor Bela and Reyna are bloody, and like, I know it shouldn't be like this, but you'd think in a patriarchal society like this one where girls are like coddled like that, they would be extra like hard on Aemond for beating up little girls. I'm surprised Viserys doesn't at least acknowledge it. I understand why Allison doesn't or why no one else might. Jace quietly tells Rhaenyra that Aemond called them bastards. You see Rhaenyra make a decision. Allison accuses Rhaenyra's sons of ambushing hers, but Rhaenyra rats Aemond out right away. He questioned the legitimacy of Ace's parentage, an act of treason. Rhaenyra asks Viserys to find the root of this rumor. Who told him this vile lie? Aemond looks directly at his mother, Queen Allison, who is panicking. She scrambles to find excuses. Viserys shushes her, and just when you think he's about to say Queen Allison's name, which almost would certainly mean there's some sort of punishment, at least an end to all this, that little shit Aemond says his older brother Aegon's name. <gasps> Aegon, for his credit, doesn't try to shift the blame. He says that everyone can see that those boys are bastards. I guess this is satisfactory for Viserys, who says that he's just tired of the infighting and he demands everyone make up. Allison is not satisfied with that as a solution. Her son lost an eye. An eye for an eye. She demands it, like literally, an eye for an eye. Viserys is like, are you fucking kidding me? Rhaenyra, predictably, is like, um, absolutely not. Everyone is Done. Allison commands Sir Kristen to do it. Viserys tells Kristen to stay his hand. Allison says, no, you were sworn to me. And then Sir Kristen, looking around and seeing that Allison is way outnumbered and unhinged, and him following directions in this manner would likely result in an ass whooping or worse, he says, yes, sworn to you as your protector, my queen. That means he's not gonna go around maiming royal children for you, girl. Viserys then says that the next person to question the legitimacy of Rhaenyra's children will have their tongues removed. He looks directly at Allison when he says that, dude. Allison, viewing what Viserys just said as the medieval equivalent of calm down, makes haste to grab Aegon the Conqueror's knife out of Viserys' waistband and decides to do the work herself. That's right, we're girl bossing here on Driftmark today. She dives for Lucerys, dagger in hand, and misses Rhaenyra, who grabs the flailing weapon. Seeing that Rhaenyra has technically put hands on the queen, Sir Criston is giddy and makes haste to go knock her the fuck out like he's been waiting to do for like four episodes now, only to be stopped by Damon and the King's Guard who forcibly restrain him. Sidebar, I really love the simmering resentment between Sir Kristen and Damon. I just think it's like an equally vile stew. Either way, no matter who loses, we all win. Finally, with her dagger wavering in hand right next to Rhaenyra's eye, she tells the court how she really feels. Rhaenyra is an entitled, selfish girl who has no mind or heart for doing she feels entitled to anything she may please, including Allison's son's eye. She's clearly envious, so jealous of the opportunities of freedom that Rhaenyra has had and doesn't think Rhaenyra deserves them. Which is funny considering how spoiled Allison is raising her own kids to be, you know? When Allison pulls away, she ends up cutting Rhaenyra's arm deeply. The court looks on in horrified, stunned silence, seeing that the 
queen has literally named the princess until Aemon speaks up and says, don't worry, mother. I may have lost an eye, but I gained a dragon, and that seems like a fair trade to him. Vagar is claimed. We see visually then how the court is divided between the team greens and the team blacks. In Alicent's chambers, Sir Otto pays her a visit. She's distressed and absolutely convinced of her own ruin, but Otto, for the first time in the series, looks proud. She feels shame for losing composure. She feels as though the kingdom is going to write her off as a mad queen, as though she's disgraced the high towers and has forever poisoned the king against their cause. She says that she did an ugly thing that she regrets, but Sir Otto says that they play an ugly game, and we learn how he really feels. This is the first time he's seen her really want this. He considers himself above the king. He considers himself able to manipulate the king, and now he sees those same qualities in Alicent. Aw, he's gonna help show her how. And at the end of the day, he's not really worried about too much anymore because they have a dragon on their side now. Laner visits Rhaenyra for the first time since Alicent assaulted her. He expresses regret for slacking in his duties as husband husband to her and re-devotes himself to the cause. Rhaenyra's heart breaks, watching him struggle to set aside his love, to set aside who he is, to make things right for her, for the sake of duty, for the sake of their friendship. But she won't ask him to do it any longer. On the way back to King's Landing, Laris offers Alicent his services in acquiring an eye from one of Rhaenyra's children in exchange for Aemon's lost one. Alicent is a little sketched out at first, but then remembers she needs all the help she can get in these ugly endeavors, in this ugly game. So she says that while that won't be necessary, she will surely find a use for his willingness to maim children soon. Laris is like really pleased by this. It's disturbing when he smiles. I love it. I love it. Rhaenyra proposes to Daemon that they wed before they depart from Driftmark. Daemon asks what of Sir Laenor, and Rhaenyra responds that they just need one quick death to take care of that problem. At first, of course, like it's implied that they're gonna kill Laenor, but of course she's not gonna do that after that talk they just had. They're gonna stage Laenor's death in the cheesiest, least convincing manner possible. Damon finds Sir Carl at the docks of Driftmark and presents him with an offer and a bag of gold. Laenor and Sir Carl fight in the Great Hall of Driftmark with one witness, an easily duped child who then runs off to inform the guards. When he returns with Rhaenys, the guards, and Lord Corliss, Sir Carl and Laenor are gone. In their stead, a charred corpse is in the fireplace, presumably meant to represent Laenor. Rhaenys and Corlys buy it, it seems, but I don't know how. I don't know. I mean, okay, the sword fight was cute, though. It was a great little preamble to what they're definitely almost doing later, rocking the boat. You know what I mean? Like, rocking. maybe you don't, actually. Maybe you don't know. They're gonna get on a boat and go to Essos. Damon says that regardless of the circumstances, people will always whisper about Rhaenyra's involvement in Laenor's weird death. She says that she wants people to wonder at what she's capable of. Then Damon and Rhaenyra marry with only their disturbed, traumatized children as witnesses. The final shot is a bald-headed Laenor and Sir Carl heading to a ship ostensibly to take them off to Essos together. Was there a way to do this as swiftly and as cleanly without traumatizing Lord Corliss, Princess Rhaenys, and and their children? Probably not. Princess Rhaenys definitely was not Rhaenyra's biggest fan before, and she's definitely not a big fan of Daemon either, and she definitely will not be now. For the most in-depth look we've gotten at Driftmark, this episode did not do it justice. The lighting as a creative choice, that's bullshit. You can do that dark, dimly lit thing and still have emotion and also visuals. Like, you should be able to see things, right? I'm just curious as to why they saw fit to introduce Lena and Lenor as characters at all, honestly. It's the first season. They didn't even last seven episodes. It's kind of wild to me that they were included because they rewrote their stories so dramatically only to shorten them. A big problem with this is also the fact that the time skip takes away a big chunk of their stories. Really could have gotten into the psyche of how those royal feuds trickle down and affect their relationships, but we need to actually see those people and their inner lives. Skipping the bulk of their involvement in these politics seems unfair. There just hasn't been any satisfying buildup to my liking. And you can even see that with Aemon. Like, where is this ferocity towards those little girls coming from? I'm still loving the show, don't get me wrong. I just wish they hadn't rushed the characterization that much. I fear the writers thought an audience wouldn't trust them, so they tried to hit all the plot points they could to prove, like, look, you can trust us, like, we can handle these plot things, and maybe the network didn't give them the luxury of time. I don't know. I'm assuming there's a reason, because I think the stories behind these characters would be interesting to anybody. These seven hours back in West 
Westeros though have been incredibly enjoyable and I don't want that to get misconstrued. I am really looking forward to the next three hours of television we have left and I don't know what I'm going to do after. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Hit like and subscribe if you care and I'll see you next week for another episode of Amid Beyond Hot D. Bye bye!